We will be looking at ways we could utilize. Thank you. We will be looking at ways we could utilize all that relationship, wonderful relationship between AI and games within education and empower education. I see many colleagues here. We have been working in projects like with Vanessa Camilleri here. What you will be seeing is uh, some of that is, is joint work. And um, no? Okay. Right, you see a map. Um, so I use this map because usually when I, I'm invited to, uh, to talk about my work, people, some people don't know where Malta is. So you see Malta is there, we are here. Um, and uh, I am uh, the director of the Institute of Digital Games, professor here at the University of Malta. Oh, it's like AI, interesting. And um, I have been working in the area of AI and games for quite a bit, like about 20 years. I've been writing books. If you teach AI and games, then I highly recommend my book. It's free, you don't have to buy it, it's free. Um, and uh, I'm an editor-in-chief of the IEEE Transactions for Games. So if you work with game-related stuff of any sort, and if it's technical, if you, for instance, you know, use a new game in your classroom and you have some sort of user study and uh, somehow it works, then you could submit your work at the IEEE Transactions for Games. Um, now, because this is not enough, I also uh, co-founded a company called Model, Model AI which basically uses AI to automatically test games. And uh, you'll see some of these examples today. And uh, on the side, I'm also training people uh, from the game industry and uh, university professors on the use of AI in games. Uh, this year, we run the fifth uh, Artificial Intelligence in Games Summer School in Cambridge uh, in collaboration with uh, Microsoft Research. Microsoft, by the way, is the sister company of uh, Model AI, where just hand in hand together, because they bought some of it. So this is what I care about and what, what I will be talking about, the interrelationship between games and AI, the ways games have been helping us advance in AI, yeah? And, uh, and also the ways AI has been helping us advance game design and game development processes. And then while uh, I will be looking at this relationship, um, I hope you get something out of this that you can transfer in what you do, right? And then we will be looking at some ways we, we have transferred some of these uh, wonderful um, outcomes between this relationship uh, into education, empowering learners and educators. So AI is this evil thing that we, we experience on a, on a daily basis many years ago. And, um, you know, all of us are puzzled these days, what's going, what's going to happen next? Um, it's not that evil, actually, but uh, yeah, that's another debate, that's another keynote. But um, if you want to bring a, a definition about AI in games, uh, then uh, you would be talking about uh, the study of making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do in games, right? And then the obviously, obviously the first question that comes to mind is, what do we do in games, right? Um, what do humans do in games? And um, what do we do? Play, of course. The first thing that comes to mind is play. And obviously, because it's the first thing that comes to mind, then when, when people decided to move AI into games, they thought about the first thing that comes to mind. So how about AI that plays games? Not like humans, though, in the best, like the best human out there. So there has been a lot of focus on AI um, AI researchers focusing on building the, the best algorithms out there that will beat the best human playing a game. And then if you, if you visit the Wikipedia page of artificial intelligence, you might be able to find milestones of AI throughout the years associated primarily with games. Um, so you see here a, a panorama of these milestone moments where, you know, all the way from, uh, you know, back from the 50s with Alan Turing, top left, uh, where he tried, um, he discovered a number of uh, research algorithms on, on chess variants, uh, to nowadays, to uh, AlphaStar and StarCraft. You see a number of key moments where we, 
Well, we actually define the history of artificial intelligence. Like we're talking about algorithms that were invented on games, like you know, deep reinforcement learning, Monte Carlo research, computer vision variants, and so on. So, and you might wonder why do we actually do that? Why do we care so much about games? Well, there are many good answers because basically games are very well controlled environments, and they're quite complex for uh, for humans to play, or at least we think so. We think as humans that if a world master or you know master of chess uh, is playing chess better than anyone else, then that person should be intelligent, right? Um, we think that maybe we are wrong, um, but definitely it requires some sort of cognitive processing to play chess quite well. So we th we thought that if we might actually make AI that plays better than anyone else, then we would actually learn something about AI, or maybe learn something about ourselves. Uh, again, these are philosophical discussions I'm, I'm happy to have, but I need to move on. So instead, what we do at Model AI, and what you see here is an early prototype of one of our products, is not really looking at ways we can play a game better than anyone else, but how can we utilize AI to automatically test a game level that you just designed as, um, as a level designer? Now, why is that important? Because instead of employing humans and testing thoroughly throughout the games that you design, you can have AI that tests all the weird ideas that you have rapidly. So in a day, you might have like 10 or 20 or 1 million different ideas that AI can test for you um, and then eventually give you answers for. So what AI just figure out here is that can jump over the ledge, which is not good for your level, right? So you just died. You might not want that. Um, now, some other idea here that we explored recently with a PhD student of mine, Matt Bartet, is you know, the question of how, how about instead of actually playing a game in the best possible way, how about creating agents generative agents that they behave and feel like humans, if possible. And how are we doing that? Where we employ reinforcement learning algorithms that they learn to imitate the way humans play, but also they learn to imitate the way humans feel, or at least their arousal traces, their sort of engagement traces that they leave in videos of their play. So what you see here is an agent that sort of tries to play like a human and also tries to feel like a human uh, this particular human uh, while playing a game. And this is cool because you can have those plug and play agents that you can throw into a game and um, they have different personalities, behavior and emotion wise, and can test your games automatically. And then once you have that, you can create visualizations like this one for level designers or for game designers where your agent moves around and you have the behavior trace and at the same time, you can color the behavior trace with emotion. So red means high intensity. So you see there's like, you know, a lot of intensity here in this loop. Um, and then obviously it can be used as an experience debugging tool, right? Or as any debugging tool. So going back to my original question, what do we do in games? Obviously in order to play them, we, need, we first need to design them. And we humans actually design great games. Now, how about AI building parts of this? Right. Uh, I mean, even if you if you think this question, then you will soon realize that games is not just one thing, uh, but there are many things out there that a human needs to design or an AI needs to design. In this particular case, there are levels, there are visuals, music, sound, text, and um, environments. All of that needs to fit together somehow, and it needs to make sense, and needs to be playable, and um, needs to be fun. Right. Um, and um, arguably, this is not easy. If that was easy, then we would have AI designers getting, you know, BAFTA awards or, um, you know, winning any sort of game design competition out there. So, so let me show you some examples of how we utilize the AI um, in a, as a generative sort of game designer or as a computational game designer. Um, what you see here is early days, this is mo mo almost a decade old video, of uh, a system that is called the Mixed Initiative AI System Design System, where you have um, a designer, a computational designer, and a human designer collaborating, building a level together. So what you see on the left is an, um, 
human designer placing some sort of sketches about a strategy map, let's say, with bases, resources, and so on, some impossible areas. And then on the right, you see some suggestions generated by uh, some evolutionary computation algorithms, uh, respecting particular constraints of the design, and at the same time, pushing the boundaries of uh, human uh, creativity here, using algorithms such as novelty search. So basically, uh, algorithms that propose something completely novel to um, what uh, the designer has been designing so far. And um, well, largely speaking, you can use AI as a collaborator, or you can just, uh, or generative AI in this case, or you can just let it generate stuff for you and then you know, be happy about it. Um, obviously, when it comes to, uh, to game design, I, I would say that uh, the, the most sensible thing to do uh, is to actually consult artificial intelligence, have a collaborator that basically co-creates with you while you're designing anything. Um, and uh, this is, the whole idea of mixed initiative design we brought in uh, popular games that you might have played uh, through uh, a collaboration between Model AI and King here. How many of you have played Candy Crush? Come on, all right. Okay, half of the audience mostly. It's a very popular game. If you haven't played it, you must have heard it. Your kids play that, right? I mean, at some point, or they played it. It's not that popular anymore, but it is the mother or father, or whatever, of uh, what is called the three match style games that are very popular mobile games. It's like, you know, it's a huge industry. Um, so King, the developer of Candy Crush, collaborated with Model AI. They wanted a solution for sort of semi-autonomous level generation uh, because, you know, there are that many levels that humans can generate. And there's like thousands of levels, thousands of levels populated on a, on a monthly basis, like hundreds of, of levels on a weekly basis. And then you might not want your, um, your employers actually to, to design all these. And um, what, what you might want instead is to get some inspiration from an AI system. And this is what we, what we propose to them. There's a paper about this. And some of the levels that you play nowadays in Candy Crush might have been generated through uh, AI or completely through AI. Um, and, uh, you know, talking about chat GPT today and uh, GPT models in general, large scale uh, uh, language models. Um, nowadays, you can do really fancy things like this one. These, these are sort of images that I got yesterday from a PhD student of mine, Marvin Zamid, working on, uh, um, you know, style transfer and uh, transitions within different games. So you can just basically prompt a Counter Strike game, which is a first person shooter with, uh, you know, a candy store, and you end up with this or you might prompt uh, that image over there with you know, uh, an evening in Venice, for instance. And all of a sudden you have all these creative capacities of building entirely new worlds, frame by frame, uh, that you know, your agents can actually, or yourself can actually play, or your agents can test and live in. Let's move on to my question. What do humans do in games? Obviously, when we play, we experience. There's a lot of emotion going on, and uh, as you might know, games are very powerful emotional stores, and they actually drive us in, this basically drive us to explore all, po all possible sort of um, uh, emotional states within this sort of very rich palette. So arguably one might say that games cannot be dissociated from emotion and at the same time cannot be dissociated from learning because as you know better than me, emotion and learning are sort of like uh, brothers and sisters. So if we manage to, presumably, if we manage to actually drive a particular user into uh, particular emotional patterns, then we might be able to uh, educate them better. Who knows? Now, on that front, when it comes to research on what is called affective computing, we have been doing quite a bit uh, in understanding human emotion and from a computational perspective, to find the best possible ways in order to label those emotions. Like, you know, if the question is, what is the value of an emotion? What is the value of, a, of an experience? What is the answer? Is it 0 0.8? Is it 0 0.6? What you are feeling now? Are you bored 0 0.5? Are you frustrated 0 0.9? Um, there's no sense in all of that. And there's quite a lot of research 
been done uh, in understanding the value of, of user experience or emotion. And uh, in a recent paper of ours with, uh, with a psychologist named uh, Rodi Kawi, another uh, AI researcher, Carlos Busso, we went through quite a um, you know, bit of extensive sort of literature review on theoretical models about the value of experience and the value of emotion, and also went through empirical evidence across many fields, from AI to behavioral economics and so on. And we introduced, or actually we introduced a framework, because the idea was there, of the ordinal nature of emotions. This framework is quite popular these days in, in affective computing. Uh, and basically suggests that we don't really care about the value of emotion, we just care about the relationship between uh, temporal uh, instances of emotion. So we just care about the relative change of emotion and we should process it and represent it in this way. And what you will be seeing later on, all the results that I will be showing uh, within education and beyond are relying on this assumption that emotion is ordinal. So uh, let's see one first example of uh, emotion detection in games. So. This is um, basically, you know, PhD, early PhD uh, years of mine where I tried to uh, identify ways we can detect uh, interest in play and how uh, we can uh, evolve uh, ghosts in Pac-Man. I don't know how many of you have played Pac-Man or know what Pac-Man is, a very old game. Um, it's like a boomer game. And... Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, it's a game I, I used to play when I was a child. So, so the question was, okay, how can I make these goals a bit more interesting for me, right? So, and then obviously the, the next question that comes in is how do I define interest? Because my AI needs to know what, what is interesting and what is not. And then since then, I have been spending years of plugging people with physiological sensors, e.g., uh, skin conductance, heart rate variability, face, facial expression recognition systems to understand how they feel. Um, and I got fed up with all this, to be honest, after you know decades of research. And very recently, we just you know came up with an assumption: what if, what if we just sort of throw all this away? We don't really care about all these exotic sensors, but all we can see is what the user is doing on screen. So what's going on with the pixels on the interaction? How about we have a computer vision system that looks at the pixels of the screen? It listens to the sounds of the interaction. And, it's, and it tries to understand what the hell is going on with this game, right? Uh, can, it, can such a system detect engagement of the user? Can such a system detect any emotional label? Is emotion integrated within the pixels of, this, of the screen? Does it make any sense? So the answer is so, sort of yes. Um, so what you see here are four different games that... Uh, you have like a computer vision system, a convolutional neural network that looks at the pixels of the screen and tries to detect the arousal of the, of the game at this point, moment to moment arousal. And uh, what you see next to each game, I guess the laser pointed should work. Let me see. Not that tall. No. One. Is there a laser board in here? Maybe one would assume, but anyhow. Uh, I don't give up, so let's go back. <laughs> okay, so top uh, left, you see this game, this is a shooter game. Next to it, you see what is called an activation map uh, of a neural network. It's basically a visualiz visualization of a neural network uh, it's like a heat map. Uh, red areas indicate high attention of the neural network and blue areas, low attention. Um, and as you might be able to see, the neural network um, looks around the player while this guy shoots, but also looks at areas like the score or you know the health bar over there or the timer once in a while, indicating that for, for a neural network or for an AI to detect arousal automatically, it needs to actually look at how you play, but also changes like how how your play affects the score and your health and so on. It's quite uh, it was quite a surprising um, result for us. And you can do very well. You can actually predict arousal, annotate the arousal, moment to moment arousal, 
with an accuracy of over 85% or 90 in some cases, right? Which is quite, quite impressive. Um, not in all games though. There are some games up to the top uh, right one. It's a horror-like game. Uh, visual information is not sufficient here to actually detect anything because it's a very dark game and it's uh, not very helpful. So, so the answer is yes, you can actually do that in fast-paced games and we're actually not nowadays investigating more games and different architectures to see to which degree all that is uh, general enough. Now, here's another fun example, one of my favorite ones. Uh, what you will see here is, is a level that doesn't exist. So this is Super Mario level. How many of you have played Super Mario? Come on. Okay. Great. Most of you, you know what this game is about. Um, so this game doesn't exist. What, 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 this level doesn't exist. It basically, you know, what exists is what you see on the screen. What comes on the right is generated when, when, I, press, when I press the button of this video. Well, it's pre-generated, but you know, once you start playing. And um, you have two AI agents here. You have an agent that plays the game uh, in a very boring way, as you will see. And you have another agent that looks at how this AI player is playing and designs the level online as the other player is, is, is playing. How does our AI designer design a level? Uh, it tries actually to maximize the fun of the AI player. And how do we measure fun? Well, we went to the literature, we met this guy, Raf Koster, and his really cool uh, um, book called The Theory of Fun uh, for Game Designers, which essentially, Raf Koster says fun equals learning. And uh, when it comes to game design, nothing surprising. But uh, also suggests that fun equals to moderate le levels of diversity over time. So basically, you give to your player, to your users, uh, patterns that are not completely unmastered or noisy, uh, or you know, you give you give to your users patterns that they are um, not that easy to master, right? So you need to moderate the diversity of what you give. So here it goes. Let's look at it. So you have a boring AI player, it's like an A-star player, very, very uh, predictable in what it's doing. And the other poor guy, the AI designer, is trying to maximize the fun for this, for this person or person, AI persona. Um, as you might be able to see, there's like, you know, diverse patterns um, over time, trying to sort of diversify the way AI, the AI player is playing the game. It's like a, a fun experiment in my view of what is possible today within uh, generative AI in games. So what about beyond games? Before jumping into education, I'll show you a couple of more slides about you know, transferring all this technology to other domains than purely games. And then the first thing that comes to my mind, at least, is design in general, like structural engineering, uh, architecture, urban planning and so on. So, and uh, obviously you can utilize games like Minecraft to build novel buildings and uh, you know, uh, basically using cool algorithms that will come up with some really, really weird buildings that they're, they are still sort of stable enough that they won't fall. You can interact with architects. You can propose sort of geometrical geometries of buildings to architects in a, in a VR setting. You can uh, rebuild Boston. This is the MIT area. Uh, and you keep uh, MIT and you scrape the rest. You just uh, destroy the rest and then you rebuild Boston so that the uh, Bostonians f uh, have uh, feel better. Um, well, what's the right word here? They have better levels of comfort uh, during extreme uh, weather conditions. So you have some sort of simulations that they can predict that. So you can do cool things like that. And uh, then you can collaborate with... Uh, Let's move on. You can collaborate with uh, architectural studios like Zaha did. This is the villa uh, from a Ru Russian guy somewhere in Siberia. Uh, very, very rich person. And uh, what you can do is get the model of this villa and um, apply some evolutionary algorithms, changing uh, the structure of the top floor so to, to, to maximize particular criteria. And again, we are looking at tools that are, you know, offering this mix initiative interaction with with a designer. In this particular case, a structural engineer or uh, an architect of Zaha did. 
And um, you can take it one, for, one step further. This is really recent work that was published a few days ago, where you can use those really big language models like chat GPT or GPT-4 or whatever, or variants, and uh, use them for architectural design instead, right? Retrain them or fine tune them to basically give you, okay, uh, basically give you a room uh, or sort of, so, sorry, a flat with uh, a bedroom and a living room, a kitchen, a bathroom or two bathrooms, two living rooms adjacent to each other, whatever you like as a prompt, right? And then you get some inspiration as a designer, as a client, as a, as you. So um, let's jump to, to this. You care about, mostly you care about this, I, I guess. Uh, how can all this technology empower education? And I'll show you some examples of what we have been doing over the years. Uh, and this is, this is quite ancient by now, but it's like a decade old. But uh, this is the first project where, it's the first European project where we try to transfer all these sort of user modeling ideas and uh, generative AI ideas in games into a game, uh, into an educational game. Uh, this game is called uh, Village Voices. It was built around the, the project Siren, FP7 project, very old, uh, where we were tasked with, with uh, the design a game that teaches uh, conflict resolution to, um, to primary school students. Um, we have some quests. This is a multiplayer game, as you see in a village, a medieval village. We have a number of quests that are generated by the AI system. Uh, students can leave labels about how happy they are with their sort of interactions with the, the other players and so on. We use these labels to model conflict, the level of conflict in the game. And then we generate quests so that we keep conflict at moderate levels. We have been obviously interacting with pedagogues and trying to understand what conflict is and how we teach conflict, that we need to actually elicit conflict, but conflict doesn't need to go that high because then students actually smash into each other and they actually fight. We have seen, I have some videos, unfortunately I didn't bring that, uh, in Portugal where students actually by playing this game, they actually were fighting after this or during the game was really cool, uh, but it was not appropriate. So when <laughs> we needed to, to, to modify uh, what we were doing, we we're actually tr treating those poor students as lab rats. So, um, so yeah, but, but uh, it got the best paper, or oh, best learning game in Europe award. I don't know how that happened. Let's move on. Um, uh, we also transferred quite a lot of um, these ideas on understanding a, a, a user, like a student of a, of a game, uh, that teach about uh, uh, dyslexia, basically, sort of assist students to uh, combat dyslexia. And we have been designing within the iLearn project, we have been designing a number of different mini games that they attack different aspects of this dyslexia. Like, uh, this was my favorite here. Uh, the whole game was around, uh, you know, it had the me Mexican flavor. Um, and... Um, then you have this guy, I mean, th this is my favorite one. You have uh, the, the mariachis here singing a song and then the student uh, on real time had to pick the right word that fits uh, in the sentence, just that attacking a particular dyslexia issue. And then when it comes to AI, uh, we had a student modeling feature that would identify aspects that needed more sort of care and more assistance and then would uh, propose to the student particular mini games for uh, you know, for their own needs. Um, let's move on to this one. Does um, yeah, I'm out of time. Um, this is another project that uh, was over a few years ago, where we brought the idea of uh, understanding player. Uh, student student um, performance using what is called uh, what was called in, uh, uh, in in the game industry and very popular as a term game analytics right so game analytics exists for the last 20 uh, 15 years in, in the game industry uh, the idea of bringing game analytics into the classroom eventually was called learning analytics and um, so that project views that transition uh, of knowledge from games to the classroom, yeah, and uh, the meeting point is a number of virtual labs where you can uh, have your uh, students playing. Yeah, we basically created two, one on chemistry and one on wind energy. 
And uh, through the interactions of students with those labs, we, could, we were able to sort of um, cluster behaviors and notify uh, the, the teacher about what's going on in the, in, in, the, in the classroom as a whole. And then the teacher would be able to modify those labs to meet particular learning objectives. Uh, these, these guys are uh, available to download from the MVSAS website. Um, and now moving into uh, something that is quite recent, and I guess that gives a good pass to Vanessa. Vanessa, are you talking about this as well? LearnML? No? Okay. Um, uh, I assumed it. So this is a very uh, excellent collaboration between the Institute of Digital Games and the um, uh, AI department um, and our personal collaboration with Vanessa. Um, this is the project, this is an Erasmus Plus project that was over a few months ago, uh, which we called Learn to Machine Learn. So this is where we wanted to teach basic AI principles to primary and secondary school students using games as the vehicle, right? Uh, why games? Because of all these great uh, features that they have, because they're engaging and so on. And um, obviously being one of the first games that they teach about artificial intelligence principles. Uh, we had many game design issues to resolve here. Uh, we have been organizing workshops with pedagogues, the students themselves. We got quite a bit of feedback. And uh, we ended up with a series of two games within the same sort of package that we called Artbot uh, that teach basic principles of supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And uh, basically, you can, you can visit, uh, you can download the games from Artbot at Google Play uh, or visit uh, art-bot.net and download the games, play them online, and uh, download corresponding material, um, educational material that comes like the pedagogical scenarios that come with these games. So highly recommended if you're interested in AI education. Um, so... Let's look at this video. Right, so the first mini game uh, is about teaching about supervised learning. So you, you have this bot, the art bot, that tries to distinguish between paintings and sculpture. So the student needs to provide the data, like what is a painting, what is a sculpture, and so on. Play with the parameters of the algorithm. This is a very simple decision tree, by the way. Playing with the parameters of the algorithm, like what the decision tree needs to look at, how many colors, how deep the decision tree should be, and so on. And then basically, what you see here is that the student interacting with the tool and the parameters. And then if the student is not happy, you have the testing set and the tra tra training set where the student can sort of look at where my algorithm fails, where my algorithm succeeds in classifying paintings versus uh, sculptures. And then once, supposedly, once you train your bot to distinguish between paintings and sculptures, then you throw it into a museum and you ask it to find the sculptures, right? Using reinforcement learning in this case. So this mini game scenario is about reinforcement learning where the student can identify, can define the rewards and the penalties. Like these are basic principles for reinforcement learning. Play with exploration parameters, play with the state representation, a number of different parameters and observe the behavior of the agent. Go back to the parameter tuning, the hyperparameter tuning. If they are not satisfied, you know, continue, play again and see how things behave. And we have a number of levels here uh, for uh, reinforcement learning. And that's, that's only the start, of course, because uh, three years ago, teaching about supervised and reinforcement learning was a hot thing. Nowadays, it's just boring. I mean, you have all these sort of diffusion models, large language models, and who knows what we'll have like tomorrow. So while still uh, relevant, I think there's so much more that can be done uh, in, in that space. Right, and, uh, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you want to know more about what we do at Institute of Digital Games, you can visit us at game.edu.mt. Thank you so much, Matt, for inviting. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be taking some questions now from the audience. So 
Well, I just had a question of going back to the children's game and the uh, training set that you did with the experiment with the Portugal kids where they fought after playing your game. Um, was there any aspect where in your um, theory design after they um, showed how they felt about conflict, conflict? Did they, did you put any thought about or add any um, pieces to how they would cope? after conflict. Thank you, sorry, I had to, to drink some water. Um, yeah, thank you, this is a very good question. Um, obviously, um, when you design for, for children, you know, you know better than me, but uh, in my, my experience with uh, co-designing with pedagogues and children themselves, um, and you know, especially you know, collaborating with Vanessa, people that actually know how to do this, um, it's often the case that you do, you, you do things, you have your sort of adult mindset and you design things that are out of this world for them. You are much older, um, you, you have different game experiences than they do. Uh, they play very different games than Pac-Man. And, and so when you design, you're, you're biased, obviously. And uh, they actually help you uh, to redesign. And in that process, they, they, there are mistakes. Um, that they're made. So you design games that you think, or you design AI that you think is going to help them, and it doesn't really. Um, and uh, it, it is a concern on how, how we should be designing things. And obviously, primarily, you need to design things with educators before those games reach children. We did that, but that was still not enough. So, yeah, uh, obviously, we had... Uh, in-person meetings with uh, students themselves, I mean, through their teachers, and all of that interaction helped us improve on the games. But um, testing as a, as a process is very painful, uh, game testing, it's very painful. Uh, it takes a lot of time and, uh, yeah, and a lot of human and uh, computational resources sometimes. So it's the reason why we founded Model AI, so that you know you don't have to do the testing. AI has, you know, does it. So yeah, I don't know if I answered the question, but uh, yes, we of, of course uh, consider their feedback uh, and uh, to redesign the game. And then the educator had to deal with particular conflicts that uh, were elicited by the game. But those, oh yeah, now I remember it's ten years. Sorry. The educator in this particular case told us that, you know, there are certain conflicts in the classroom that they last for, for long and, you know, uh, games can elicit those. And this is the purpose, right? So you just sit there and then you have a particular virtual scenario where you don't hit each other. Well, in that particular case, they were sitting next to each other. So it was, you know, it's a, it's a multiplayer game, but still played in classroom. Um, so conflict resolution is a long-standing issue uh, that could be elicited through games. And this is exactly what the educators wanted so that they can actually reflect on, on the, on the um, situation and so on. But in, in a number of instances, that was way too much, uh, right? So we had to readjust. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to situate myself historically. So you are probably the second generation forward from the work that I and my late husband were doing, 70s, 80s, 90s, early VR, um, work with a 1K, 1K Kim. Um, and so my reaction when you have the relation between AI and games is, from my perspective, I need a, a third, and that's the human or us, right? which is always there. I mean, that's who's uh, really having the experience. And so there, there used to be a, a saying called f fun follows function. Mm -hmm. And that's what I thought of when you showed Coster. So I'm wondering if, if that third is us, and in this case, it's the child, it's education and learning. Um, so conflict was one good question. The other is, so here are children who have dyslexia. You want to help them overcome that so they can learn things and um, 
that's great. You know, what's upstream is why do so many children have dyslexia? What is it? Did it exist before? Is it a, a product or a reflection of the fact that we, you, we were producing new human, new the next generation of, of humans and their cognitive processes or, or a limited simulacrum of humans. Um, how does your work, you know, how do you conceive your work in terms of where those philosophical questions, I mean, you're being very practical and um, pragmatic, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind adventuring just briefly into what's the relation of your work, given, well, I don't know your background, to, to that, to I'm doing this thing because I assume X. What, what is X? Can you go upstream a little for me? All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, wow, okay, this is deep. Um, so I'll, I'll, start, I'll start with the practical things that you said about dyslexia, for instance. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not certain, I'm not an expert uh, of dyslexia studies, or I'm, I'm not an expert myself, or, or even a pedagogue. Well, I, I guess I am. I mean, I teach, but to a degree. But um, I, during the I Learn RW project, we have been collaborating with uh, big um, societies or foundations about dyslexia. Uh, what I gathered from from their interaction was that dyslexia is not, I, I guess, back then. I'm, I'm not sure what's going on nowadays. Um, dyslexia is not a, a a growing problem. It's it's standard. It's fixed. It it affects a particular percentage of of people um, and it depends on language. So if all of us would speak Italian, we wouldn't have such a big issue. It, uh, the language itself actually creates, uh, it, it, uh, it's a barrier when it comes to dyslexia, um, to my surprise. Um, so Danish, for instance, I don't know if there's a, a Danish person here. I was, I was in Denmark for 10 years. Danish, according to studies, is the hardest um, language in Europe when it comes to this lecture, right? It's, it's because it's basically what you see has no limited relation to what you say. Like, you know, whereas Italian is like one-to-one -one letter. Um, now, to discuss about my own vision about what I do, um, it's a very, very interesting question. Um, well, I guess I have to trace back what I initially wanted to do when I started doing research. And uh, as, uh, and this is what my PhD is about 15 or so years ago, uh, was to have more fun when playing games. And, um, and this is what, and then, then I tried to discover technologies that will help me do that. I've, I've, back in the days, I felt that the games were too predictable, too boring for, uh, for any one of us. And then this, is, this was basically the initial seed. And, uh, and because I was a, a very active gamer myself, I managed to actually convert my hobby to a profession. And you know, being here with us today, it was just like playing games, actually, by playing games. And this is why I tell my children as well, uh, you know, it's a, it's a hobby that turned into something that's really, really cool to, to do on a daily basis. So I love my job. I want to make interaction more fun. Um, and I think that applies to many fields, from architecture to, to education. Is that high enough or more, right? Because, you know, maybe with a, a glass of wine, we could get deeper. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, I don't want to speak only as an as an educator, but um, to identify myself, um, I am a mother that taught her children uh, at about the age of ten. 
uh, that was uh, some 20, 25 years ago, to play games. And I have been following them to the point where my son supposedly one was one of the top uh, gamers that you wanted to be hired for testing games and, and so on as you people do. What I have been following in all of this is in effect what uh, attracted most my uh, attention when you said um, the criterion of arousal. Arousal is a very um, non-descriptive level only measuring uh, of emotion, of engagement, of sentiment. It does not differentiate between uh, good sentiments, bad sentiments, aggressive sentiments, uh, supportive sentiments. And to get to the uh, point, I have been uh, following uh, the aggressiveness in the games and the conflict uh, producing, inciting, one might say, which is part of my question, uh, um, that kill, 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 extinct. Uh, I started teaching them how to, um, you know, put down Briggs in order to get, you know, you may remember that name, it was when you were a child, uh, to, to get a bunch of money and then keep getting the treasure right. by putting down walls. Now, you, the more you kill, the more um, it, uh, it arouses you. But how, how can you teach through games levels of arousal that are not only about killing, about extinction? Um, it is very positive that it has an engagement in a competitive sense, go to the next level. But much of the go to the next level doesn't seem to have any creativeness into it. It has the sense of repeat, repeat. You do 10 times the mistake and then you find out the right solution. So you can say that tries to make you a bit smarter, but does it have any sense of creativeness? I think you can see where I'm going. What is it that we can do in this clearly employing technology to go to next steps and it will keep leading us. But what we know about, uh, and you know better, about uh, designing AI systems, it's on the criteria that, it gives them, that we give them. If the criterion of itself is always only competitiveness, only conflict, only aggression, Aren't we just keep escalating to levels that we are feeding our system and how can we uh, try and do it in a different way? Because, you know, there is a conflict with learning. We bring kids to school, not only to teach them about things that, that are knowledge, quote unquote, but also to get socialized in a society, learn norms and whatever. But is this helping us, especially from a very young age? Mm. Uh, toward these directions? You people have very good questions. Uh, and very, 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 they're multifaceted, actually. Uh, and they contain several sub-questions. So I don't know, I'll try my best. <laughs> sure, okay. Um, but that was, that was uh, okay, I'll try my best here because there are many sub-questions. Um, so let's. I think the big the big issue is uh, is games and our perception about what they do to us. And there's a long discussion about this. Is the the communities are divided between how bad games are versus how good games are. Obviously, there are bad games and good games as much as there are good videos. Sorry, good movies and bad movies, books and so on. So when when we give our kids games to play, we need to be aware of this. When it, when we give games or when we design games in the classroom, we need to be aware of this. Not all games are about shooting. Uh, I showed you some shooting games, but uh, shooting games are great. But to the degree that um, you know, they basically teach us what uh, reflection times, right? Anything else might be bad for 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 particular ages. There are games like Minecraft where you have three forms of creativity, social creativity, yeah, social interaction, especially during COVID game, the COVID era. There are games like uh, Papers, Please, where they teach you about, you know, the um, um, award-winning games. They teach you about the, the struggles of uh, immigrating from Syria all the way to Europe 
Um, there are so, especially independent game productions, as much as independent movie productions in Europe are so much better than the Hollywood uh, style productions in, uh, you know, um, when it comes to movies. So I think, you know, when we think about games, because all of us have, uh, well, I mean, we have different ages here, but uh, I mean, the very, you know, the very first idea of a gamer being, I think the gamer started as, as a stereotype started to be in this sort of teenager that plays arcade games, Pac-Man and Super Mario in a, in a, in a place full of smoke and, you know, beers and so on. Then it moved to uh, a teenager that shoots people. Uh, we still have those people out there that actually play games, but we have far more. We have all of you that actually play games. I, I'm, sh I am sure, or most of you play games, and you play very different games. Now, yes, games can be uh, addictive to a degree. Uh, to which degree addiction is part of the medium or part of the personality is another open discussion that is still not closed, I think. Um, and um, you also touched upon arousal. Arousal is, uh, uh, is uh, yes, you're, you're right, the intensity of emotion. We tested it out here with pixels because the community of affected computing cares about a particular model of emotion, uh, which uh, basically splits emotion into intensity and pleasureness of emotion. So it's like a two plane. Uh, there's no reason why we picked arousal other than that, to be honest, because you know you need to publish a paper. Um, so arousal doesn't might not make any sense when it comes to educational practices. Other emotional labels or purposes might make sense, like frustration or uh, you know engagement and so on. Um, so you touch upon many many different uh, important aspects, but. Uh, what? There's a question, or ah, no, but that, let, let, let me just conclude. Um, yeah, I, I think it. I think my answer is like you know, uh, to, to 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 keep it short. Not all games are the same. Uh, there are games out there for any purpose, and uh, there are many good games out there we can utilize. We can further build and uh, teach students various things. Um, and then how we use AI in each particular game is a very open question about what we want to teach, what the learning objective is. And, you know, it's not all about shooting, <laughs> right? Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Yes. So first of all, thank you, Professor, for this intriguing talk. Yes, I would like to reply to you as well. And what's coming to mind, first of all, I come from the University of Malta, and lately I did some research on esports. Um, what comes to mind is what I'm sure you know about Melanie Mitchell, she wrote a book about artificial intelligence, is we have to focus on what makes us human. And what makes us human can actually help us integrate and work alongside machines. Now, what I intend to say is that when we play games, we have to focus on qualities that tend to come natural and we come to take them for granted. For instance, if I'm playing a competitive game and we are in a team, different people have different functions to do in that particular game, but they have to work together or the boat will sink. So you have the decision makers, you have the leaders, you have those who are actually staying in the background, taking care of the leading players. So when we consider this quality of games, it will help, it will enable people to make their own decisions, be original in what they do. And these are qualities that we take to take them for granted, but they are very much important. And actually they form part of the qualities of education 4.0, if we intend, as I say it, to survive in style in this age of machine autonomy. So yes, games should definitely have an integral part in our educational system, but we have to learn to naturalize to them in our educational system, where they become the obvious way where we can bring up these qualities which go beyond just regurgitating content. So that's my comment. Thank you very much. The final question, because it's time for the next keynote. 
Thank you. Uh, Martin Reinhardt from Northern Michigan University. Question I have is, what did you find in your research, if anything, about hackers, uh, people that like to play outside the lines, color outside the lines, uh, not play by the rules? Thank you. Uh, these are my favorite people, actually. The, the, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, let me not extend it into political discussion here, but, you know, people that break the rules are the best people. Why? Because they basically reframe uh, boundaries, they, they come up with new ideas, and I can give you examples of people breaking rules and inventing new games. Um, I don't know how many of you have played Quake, for instance. It's an old game. Um, basically, in Quake, you could one one person all of a sudden realize that uh, can use a rocket launcher to jump. If you if you shoot the rocket launcher like that, you could jump higher. That enabled an entirely new genre of games that they use these rocket rocket launchers in order to you know basically jump from platform to platform. Um, and uh, there are many of these wonderful examples of people exploiting bugs in games and coming up with an entirely new game. And uh, some game designers on purpose leave some bugs in their code, hoping that players will actually figure it in them out and then coming up with a sort of new idea. So free form creativity, exploiting bugs, changing the rules is the best thing. We need to do that. Um, and we, you can see that from kids, you know, outside digital games, board games or any game, you give kids like rules and they break them. That's great. They should break them, right? Because they come up with better ideas for a game. So yeah, thanks for the question. Oh, I have it. Thank you, Georgios. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh,